It is, it is great to be here. Um, about uh, eight years ago, I, I co-founded a company uh, that has developed the 3D bioprinting of human tissue. And that company, Organovo, has been working with uh, pharmaceutical companies, providing them with real human tissues, little livers, kidneys, uh, uh, lung, heart tissue, that they can use to test and develop new drugs so that it, it can accelerate the development of new cures and reduce the astronomical costs. And in the future, uh, this technology may enable uh, patients to have new options for tissue and organ transplants. So that was then. Now I'm working on leather for shoes and handbags and meat for uh, snacks. It's a little different. <laughs> and, uh, and, and let me tell you why I think this may well be as if not more important. As, uh, as Stefan mentioned, uh, we've got a problem with the clicker. Uh, we've got a problem <laughs> with uh, a, a huge a global dependence on livestock. We farm more animals today than ever before in our history. And, uh, and, this, is, and this dependence is becoming a problem. There's a lot of negative externalities around this. And in fact, today, with 7 billion people on the planet, we rely on about 60 billion land animals for our meat, dairy, eggs, and leather goods. And this huge global herd has a, has, a, has a huge environmental footprint. It's the largest user of land directly and indirectly uh, through feed crops. And it is uh, one of the largest users of fresh water globally. And it is also uh, contributes a huge amount uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, which drive climate change. And, and by some estimates, it's 14%. Some estimates place it a lot higher. And either way you look at this, this is either one of, if not the leading contributors to climate change, ahead of transportation, energy, other sectors. And this is today. So in the next couple of decades, the next few decades, as the world's population grows to 10 billion, and as there's rising global wealth and consumption, our dependence on animal products is expected to nearly double. The demand is gonna nearly double. So how do you balance this equation? You cannot double those numbers. We can't do that without moving to a different planet. And while I believe there's some people in this audience working on that, that's not gonna happen, uh, unfortunately, fast enough. So we need to think of, of other ways to, to balance this equation, to solve this problem. And on top of that, there's all kinds of issues. When you, when you take animals and you concentrate them and industrialize their production, it, it leads to issues of, of, of waste and, 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 and ill treatment and harm and abuse. And, and there, there has to be a better way. And so underscoring this is also the fact that uh, meat and hide prices have been growing tremendously over just the last five years even. There's been huge volatility because at the end of the day, these are agricultural goods and they fluctuate with droughts, with weather conditions, with disease outbreaks. Um, and, and, um, and they're also huge global markets. Uh, their, their, uh, meat is a nearly $1 trillion global market, and, and leather is a $60 billion plus global market. And this, this kind of challenge and opportunity is an invitation for entrepreneurs to think about new ways of doing things. And so what, what challenges entrepreneurs is that, if you think about it, the way we raise our animals hasn't fundamentally changed a lot in the last 50 years. If you look at how a cow is raised today versus how it was raised in the, in the early 20th century, there's been incremental changes, but nothing fundamentally transformational. And, uh, and, and you know, there, there's that old joke about the theoretical physicist at a dairy conference where he gets up and he says, I have a brilliant idea. I've rethought it all. First, let's assume a perfectly spherical cow in a vacuum. And, uh, and unfortunately, there's been, there's been no perfectly spherical cow in a vacuum. Uh, yet, but, but perhaps there is an opportunity for that uh, because, let me advance, because if we can fundamentally rethink how, uh, how to grow meat and leather, uh, uh, for, we can fundamentally rethink how to grow meat and leather, uh, there is a different way to do that. We can grow these products uh, from cells themselves and in so doing, we can actually make them fundamentally better without harming animals. So what if we could do that? That would, be, that would be quite something. So what we do at Modern Meadow, our focus at Modern Meadow has been 
our realization has been that, that, that at the end of the day, meat and leather and animal products in general are made from tissues. They're made from cells. And right now, we raise entire living animals only to, to, to take a portion of them uh, to, to, to make the products that we need. And, and, and what if we could change that equation? What if we could actually make the parts that we need, the products that we need, directly from the cells themselves? So that's our insight at, at, at Modern Meadow, that we've been focusing on, on growing these products directly from cells. And, um, and in the process of doing that, if we grow it directly from cells themselves, we, we can apply innovation not just at the very end of the life cycle. We can actually design these products to be fundamentally better. So it, it actually becomes not about imitation. It can become about innovation. As a company, for us, it's very important that we, we're not, we're not the, the I can't believe it's not uh, uh, slaughtered leather, or uh, you know, we're not going after you know, the I can't believe this is not a slaughtered hamburger or a hot dog. Because if you can fundamentally re reinvent these animal products and change the way they're made, you can actually make them better. And, and uh, to, to illustrate this, we're really the only biotech company that I know of that has a chief creative officer uh, that sits alongside our chief technology officer and chief scientific officer. Because for us, design is as important as technology. The two interact. And, um, and, and however creative we may think we are, actually, uh, this is not a new idea. This idea of, uh, of, of thinking about growing animal products in a very different way is, is almost 100 years old. And in fact, Churchill famously wrote about it in the 1930s. He said, if you think about it, the way we farm our animals is absurd. There has to be a better way. And we, we should be able to grow the parts we need from cells in their own suitable medium. And he predicted in the 30s that this would happen within 50 years. It would be a reality. And Churchill's been right about a lot of things, and he's been directionally right about this. Unfortunately, he got the timing wrong. There's been advancements in the last few decades that have really enabled Churchill's vision, Churchill's vision to become a reality. And we've been fortunate to hear yesterday uh, just some of the advances from Dr. Craig Venter. He talked about advances in computing that have enabled advances in the tools of biotechnology and in, in DNA sequencing and synthesis. And, and a lot of these advances have really accelerated in uh, the, the last uh, decade and a half, the last decade, to the point where some of the advances in the toolkits of biology are improving faster in, a, in, in, in cost terms than Moore's law itself. And this has all kinds of knock-on effects. It, it allows uh, proteins to be produced in larger and larger quantities and more efficient yields. And like all tools, when you develop new tools in biology or, or other industries, you go after the highest value density applications first, which is why a lot of the tools of biology, of biotechnology, were first applied to where they matter the most, in medicine, where it's a matter of life and death. But now we're at that point where these tools are becoming so incredibly powerful that we can start to take them outside of medicine and into applications in, in, in you know, consumer and industry. Um, as well, and that's been a trend that's been really playing out in the last couple of decades and, and, and now accelerating. And so this is enabling uh, a, a, an industry around biofabrication, which is building on the toolkits of, of, uh, of biology and, and uh, cell culture and tissue engineering. So, so here are some of the components at work. You've got at the cellular level, you've got the ability to source cells to, if you want to, engineer their DNA um, and, to, and to apply um, metabolic analysis and, and, um, and uh, 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 molecular biology to tune the performance of cells. You've had in incredible advances in, in cell culture, the ability to grow cells very efficiently in very large quantities. So that's been certainly the case for vaccines. They, they are you know, grown in cells, incubated in cells. And now we've had uh, increasing scale uh, in, in industrial applications where cells are growing in larger and larger quantities more and more efficiently. And in the last couple of uh, decades, uh, since the 1990s, uh, there's been also a development in the field of tissue engineering, which is how do you assemble cells and put them together to make tissues, to create uh, therapeutic applications, uh, tissues that can be used for transplant, tissues that can be used to, train, uh, to, to treat patients by providing new uh, trachea or uh, skin grafts, uh, bone, et cetera. 
And, and finally, there's also been huge advantages in, in, in downstream processing. So as you grow with biology, you need to purify, you need to sometimes modify materials, uh, and this is where other fields like material science can also come in as well. And these are just some examples of companies that have been taking the toolkit of biology and applying it outside of medicine. You've had innovation um, in, in organisms like bacteria and yeast, uh, represented by companies like Ginkgo, uh, BioWorks that are developing applications in flavors and fragrances. So you can have completely new scents and, and completely new flavors in, in, in perfumes and whatnot. You have companies like Ecovative working on mycelium, uh, which is a fungus, to develop packaging and, and, and construction materials. Or Bolt Threads, which is working on engineered spider silk to make new textiles, new fabrics, and it's growing it in yeast rather than spiders. And also companies like Solazyme uh, and, and, and several others that had started off with biofuels, looking to grow um, uh, fuels in, in yeast and other uh, uh, organisms. In the case of Solazyme, their platform is algae and then working on higher value-added uh, specialty ingredients uh, as well, like uh, specialty uh, lubricants and also flavors and fragrances. And for Modern Meadow, our focus has been also, we, we've, we've learned a lot from this industry and we've learned a lot from the examples of other companies. And, and in developing our technology stack, we focused on the highest value density applications we can first so that as we scale and develop this technology, we can go either, uh, after other applications as well that are, that are uh, uh, broader. And if you think about it with, with a cow, the, the, the highest value density application, the part of the cow is, is actually its leather, is, it, is its hide. It's not the biggest part of the cow. It's only about 7% of the weight of the animal. But um, pound for pound, at the end of its processing as a, as a finished material, leather can be uh, around $100 or more per kilogram. And in fact, if you're talking about exotic leathers, alligator, crocodile, et cetera, it can be thousands of dollars uh, per square meter. And so as we develop this technology, that's a logical first application. And we're also developing um, uh, ways of going after, uh, uh, well, we've been developing technology to go after meat as well. And so we're starting with materials. That's our main focus as a company. We do foods and materials, but we're commercializing materials first for this for this reason. And what's exciting about materials is that, that every age uh, has been, in many respects, defined by the materials that it has mastered. And, and leather is an old material. It's an ancient material that we've had a lot of experience working with. It's, it's, it's very much part of human history as far back as civilization goes. And it's a beautiful material. And, um, and, and in the beginning, when the Stone Age, we really mastered natural materials, leather, wood, bone, shell. And then there's been, uh, as we've mastered other materials, metals and, and, and alloys, um, you know, there's been mastery of, of, of more and more materials that have enabled huge industries to emerge around it. And there's been an acceleration in the 20th century around new materials, right? Where there's been the plastics age, um, there's been um, the development of the silicon age that has enabled computing uh, and semiconductors. And in, in, since the 1970s, with the discovery of DNA, there's really been well, what, you know, what I would argue is, is the biofabrication age. Now we can go back to uh, our history where we started off with biology, and we can start to tune biology and really work with nature to make all kinds of new materials and new possibilities happen. And so if, if the graduate were filmed today, <laughs> perhaps the one word would not be plastics. It might be biomaterials. And so how do we do this? How do we actually culture leather? What's the process? We take um, uh, cells from an animal uh, through a, a biopsy that does not harm the animal. And, th and this could be a, a, a cow, it could be an ostrich, a crocodile, any animal. And so through this biopsy, you take skin cells and you isolate the cells that you want to work with. And in our case, one of the things we do is we exploit natural variation. We look at, uh, in the case of cows, young, old, male, female, different species. Uh, and we look at many, many different types of cells to find the best natural performers, those cells that grow well, healthy, that produce lots of collagen, because collagen is the main protein-building block of leather. So that's what we're optimizing for. And we're finding what, what it is that nature can give us first. And in the case of our materials, then, we also have a cell engineering program, where we then take those cells, we immortalize them, and we tune uh, their, 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 the, these cells to produce more collagen. 
So we play around with their DNA to be able to upregulate the, the collagen production mechanism so they can produce DNA um, collagen even more abundantly. And then we grow these cells in very large quantities. Where initially we may start with millions of cells from a biopsy, but now we can grow billions and billions and billions of cells. And then we take those cells and we need to assemble them into tissues because cells alone are not the finished product. So what we do is we, uh, we have many different ways of actually assembling our materials. One example is this, where we grow our cells on uh, surfaces and when they achieve confluence and start touching one another, they produce their extracellular matrix, which is primarily composed of collagen and collagen is the main building block of leather. And so when we have these sheets of, of, of uh, skin cells with their collagen and we layer them together, we biolaminate them, we essentially create a hide. And this hide has the same structural biology as real leather. It's composed of collagen, collagen fiber. But it is different in the sense that it doesn't have hair on it, it doesn't have flesh on it, and it doesn't have fat on it. So that when you actually take it through a tanning process, you can skip a lot of the really messy parts of it. And you can use a much more benign chemistry, so your tanning is a lot cleaner. And then we finish the material and we work with design companies to make very nice uh, finished products. And here's um, a representation of what the process looks like in video form. So again, the perfect animal, find the perfect cells. And then we grow them in large quantities. And then we recapitulate the structure of, of hide. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So why is this interesting? Why is it that consumers and brands care about this? There's many reasons. You know, one, you've already heard that prices are increasing. Uh, there's a, a growing global demand for leather goods. Everyone seems to want leather in their car seats and in their furniture and, and, and whatnot. And there's a limited availability of quality hides because many animals are grown primarily for their meat these days. So the hides are imperfect. They come with scars and insect bites and imperfections. And then there's all kinds of issues around traceability and animal welfare. And there's a lot of waste. This is the thing that shocked me the most. If you're making shoes, you typically waste about 20% of the materials that you work with. And this is at the end of a very long supply chain. And if you're making car seats, you waste about 50% of the material, of a fully finished material. And get this, if you're making watch straps, luxury watch straps, you can waste as much as 85% or 90% of the material. And that's a very expensive material. And that's just crazy. And of course, there's variable quality because it's an agricultural product. There's durability issues. And most interestingly, uh, you can also, you know, leather is a found object. You can only manipulate it at the end of its life cycle uh, through tanning. But if you could actually design it with the end application in mind, you can really bring out better design and performance properties. And so this illustrates the toxicity of beam house operations. We skip that. You know, we also significantly reduce that 20 to 50 to 85% waste that's in the leather industry. We, we reduce that significantly because we can grow the, the size and the shape of the leather that we need for the application. And we can also dial in. We can make leather finally a tunable or programmable material. We can bring out the aesthetic qualities we want, the durability, the thickness, the, the, the various properties that really matter for that application. And then of course, in going from being a slaughtered product to a cultured product, it, it, it can be a lot more efficient in land use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, and energy use. And this is not only good for the environment, but at scale, this also translates into to economic benefits as well. So our focus is on materials, but we're also working on foods. We've got a food program as well. And if you think about it, this idea of culturing foods is not a new one. It goes back thousands of years. Beer, wine, yogurt, cheese, coffee, 
I mean, in fact, you cannot have a fun weekend without cultured foods or, or, or beverages. <laughs> and so really, this idea of culturing meat is really just the newest chapter in, a, in this long saga. And so we've been playing around with ideas of how we would develop this and what would be the first application we would go after. And we came up with, kind of whimsically, with this idea of a snack food product, which we call steak chips. Uh, it's like a crunchy form of beef jerky. It's steak chips without the bull. <laughs> and it's made without harming animals, much less harm to the environment, nutritionally very high value. It's very high protein, low fat. Uh, it's, it's got a, a delicious umami savory flavor. It's got very high quality ingredients. It's natural cells. Here, there's no genetic modification. Natural cells grown in natural ingredients um, and in a process that can be entirely transparent. Whereas today, you know, the meat industry is not going to be entirely transparent about, how, about what they do, uh, how, they, how they do what they do. And in fact, the process uh, to grow steak chips, I'll go through this fairly quickly, is you take cells from an animal. Here, you don't modify the DNA. You grow them in large quantities, and then you chef it up. You, you take the cells. You mix in a little bit of pectin. We've been working with a fantastic R&D chef to create different sauces, barbecue and teriyaki and different flavors. Uh, and we've baked, essentially, um, a, a type of uh, potato chip, but starting with this, this special ingredient of, uh, of, of cultured uh, beef. And uh, so far, um, I should say, we've had a couple hundred people try this. So fewer people have tried this than have been on the space station. Um, and our, our very first taster outside of the company was Sergey Brin. Um, and, we've had of the, uh, and we've had many other people taste it as well. And of the 200 people that have tried this, about 30 or 40 have been vegetarians and vegans. And that's been really, you know, that's not the primary uh, target for the uh, audience for this, but, but it's been really moving for me, some of those tastings of people who've been decade-long, multi-decade-long vegetarians saying, you, you know, this addresses the issues that I have around eating meat, and this would be the kind of meat I would eat. So that's really moving for me. Uh, we're now based in Brooklyn. We started off in California and Missouri. Moved, we moved to Brooklyn, because you know why not? Um, uh, it's actually been a great creative design uh, technology uh, uh, area for us. And we have a lot of collaborations with partners uh, in and around New York and out of Europe. So it's a great place for us to be. And we've got a beautiful 10,000 square foot facility right on the waterfront. We would invite you to come visit us there. Um, and our vision for the future is that rather than animal products being made in, in concentrated feedlots and in slaughterhouses that are remote, guarded, and hidden, that the process can be fully transparent, and it can run like a brewery, like a distillery. And you can go there, you can see the process from beginning to end, and you can sample the goods. And, uh, and that the future, if we, if we pull this off, the, the future would be, uh, would be a lot more cultured. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>